going through the ancestors of Christ, or at least a couple key people in that, and we're talking about what that means for us in this Advent season. Genesis 32, starting at verse 22. The same night he, Jacob, arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. So Jacob. Jacob's whole life... He never let anyone get the best of him. If you know the story of Jacob's life and what he did and certain events in his life, you know that Jacob was kind of a fighter. He was somebody who didn't back down from a challenge and he whenever he was up against somebody, he always he always came out on top. So he uh got the birthright from his older brother Esau. He had tricked his father Isaac and uh, of his father-in-law Laban. He really outsmarted his father-in-law so that at the end, his flocks were bigger than his father-in-law Laban. So now that he's in another confrontation, Jacob is the kind of guy he doesn't lose. And so he's not going to let this man get the best of him here. So Jacob is wrestling with this man. And then in verse 25, something interesting happens. It says, When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So, in verse 25, Jacob is strong, but this man here has some special powers. He can put your hip out of joint with just a touch. There's some, there's some rumors in the martial arts community about like, like a, a death touch where if you just touch somebody a certain way and then they can just fall down dead or something like that. Well, this man here just touched Jacob's hip and suddenly it came out of joint. That's uh, quite, a, quite a bit here. This is, uh, this is uh, Raven's tight end, Dennis Pitta, and he's t- being taken off the field here because his hip came out of joint. And uh, it is extremely painful to have. I've never had it, and I don't think I've ever known anybody. Nothing comes to mind of anybody I've known who's had it. But uh, to have your hip come out of joint, that requires some major contact, a major impact. In fact, the only way that this really occurs in in our daily lives is if there's like a high-impact fall or a car crash or something like that. So you have to have some pretty major hit to have your hip come out of joint. Um, When I was uh, looking into this a little bit, there was a doctor that says, uh, the injury that in sports even that is the most significant and very unusual is a hip dislocation. The hip has such strong ligaments that hold it in place. It is very rare to be dislocated, even in sports like football. So, in Jacob's case here, he's just touched and the hip comes out of joint. Now, 
That, 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 that should be kind of a clue there that you're not wrestling with just anybody here. You're wrestling with somebody who at least has some sort of special powers or techniques or something like that. I've been studying martial arts for quite a long time, and I could not make somebody's hip come out of joint with just a touch. That would take a lot. So after Jacob's hip is dislocated, he's probably in a lot of pain. He can only hang on at this point. He's just grabbing this guy for dear life. And so this wrestler says, he says, let me go. Jacob must have been refusing to let go. Let me go. Jacob doesn't want to lose here. He's not a guy who, who loses. So he's not going to get, he's not going to uh, lose now after he's won so many exchanges in the past. Now, it takes a lot of tenacity to not let go when your hip is dislocated with just a touch. I think most of us, if you were in that much pain and somebody had that much power in just a touch, I think that we probably would let go, or at least I probably would have. Okay, this guy is way beyond where I am in, in skill and, and ferocity. But Jacob, he's a tenacious guy. He's not going to let anybody get the best of him. He is not going to lose. He's not going to come in second, and this is no exception. He's going to win this exchange. But it seems also, though, that Jacob is not entirely clueless as to who he's wrestling with. His request shows that he has some idea who this is, at least some idea. He has some idea that this is somebody who can bless him. Though we don't know exactly how much he knows at this point, but he knows that this guy is special somehow, and he's not going to let go until he is blessed. This is, this is a different sort of a guy. This is, this is who Jacob is. He saw something in this guy he's wrestling with that he does not want to let go of. But Jacob's request also shows incredible boldness here. I mean, what kind of a person... I mean, we don't know exactly who Jacob thought this was, whether it was an angel or God himself. I mean, we don't know when he realized it was God himself, whether it was at the end or if it was at this point. But even so, who would pin God to the ground and make demands like that? Who would do that? Who does he think he is treating God like that? This is... Some incredible boldness on the part of Jacob here. I will not let you go unless you bless me. So then this man says to him, what is your name? What is your name? Now, he didn't ask him his name because he didn't know what his name was. I mean, obviously he knew what his name was. But back then... Names meant more than what they do now. What is your name is basically asking, what sort of a person are you? Who are you? He already knew Jacob's name, but names, particularly back then, described personal identity. What sort of a person are you? So when you were given a name back then, that usually meant that either there was a characteristic of sorts that you either had to live down or that kind of defined your whole life. We don't think of names that way as much now, but that's the way it was back then. Names were very significant. Now Jacob, the name Jacob literally means he grabs the heel. If you know the story, there was, Jacob was a twin And he was born with his twin brother Esau. Esau came out and it says in the story that Jacob was grabbing his heel. So he was named. He grabs the heel. 
But Jacob means figuratively, he cheats. We have an expression in English called, that's his Achilles heel or her Achilles heel. And that means that this is kind of like your your weak spot where if somebody wanted to take advantage of you, you know, they go after your Achilles heel and then you would, you would lose or you would be overcome or something like that. Well, it's not too much unlike that. So if you grasp the heel, it's kind of like going after somebody's Achilles heel. It means like you cheat. You take advantage of other people. When Jacob stole his, uh, the birthright and the blessing away from his older brother Esau when they were older, Esau, in Genesis 27, verse 36, says, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. So his name suits him. Jacob's blessing is a new name. He has a new name now. Not given to him by mom and dad, but given to him by God himself. And that new name is Israel. And Israel means, as it says in our text note here, if you have your Bibles open, he strives with God. So what's in a name? Jacob's new name means he's a new person. Instead of a deceitful usurper of people, he's now a contender with God. Instead of going after others' blessings, he's now after God's blessings. And instead of deceiving to win, he now just needs to ask God. It's kind of almost like a little bit of a conversion story there. In the broader scope of Jacob's life, you know him when he was younger. He was, he was a cheater. He was somebody who you would not really want to know this guy or even live next door to him because he was, he was kind of a rotten guy. But throughout Jacob's life, God enters every so often. And each time God enters, Jacob changes just a little bit. And by the time he's at the end of his life, it's like he finally gets it. He's finally a man of faith. After a long time, Jacob's whole story is one where God has chosen him and in spite of all of Jacob's stubbornness, God is going to make him into a man of faith, even if it takes a long time. So verse 29, Jacob says, and what is your name? And then his response is not, oh, my name is, it's, why is it that you ask my name? It's almost like here that this wrestler, this mysterious man, is saying, Jacob, don't you know me? Verse 24, the the wrestler is a man. In verse 25, it says again that this this is a man here. But in verse 30, Jacob makes a conclusion that this wrestler is God. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. So, we have somebody here who is man and God. This wrestler is known today as Jesus Christ. Or the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. The pre-incarnate Son of God. Nobody else would fit this description. In John 1, verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So just just a brief thought for you here. There's a bunch of times in the Old Testament when people have said to have seen God. But John here, and in other places, there's other verses that could be mentioned here, it says nobody has ever seen God. 
The Old Testament people have never seen the Father. In one of Paul's epistles, it says nobody can see Him or ever has seen Him. So when the people in the Old Testament, when it says that they saw God, they're actually seeing the Son. They're seeing Jesus Christ before He became human. He was the one, all since the beginning, who has been revealing Himself to the people of Israel. It was the Son, Jesus, the whole time. And now, in this Christmas season, or in the Gospels, then He becomes, he becomes one of them. But it was Him the whole time revealing who God was. Look at the screen here. Let's answer this together. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because He saves us from our sins. Salvation cannot be found in anyone else. It is futile to look for any salvation elsewhere. It's futile. And Jacob, wrestling with this man, God, person, he knew that. And that's why he hung on to him. And that's why he demanded a blessing, because there's nobody else that would have anything that he would rather have. It's futile to look elsewhere. So some things for us today. Like Jacob, we can be bold and even aggressive in approaching God. We can be bold and even aggressive when we come to God. In Hebrews 4.16 Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. With confidence we draw near to the throne of grace. Confidence, holding our head up high. Some translations it says boldly. We can do this with boldness. We can walk right up to God and lay our requests to Him. God rewards those who pursue Him with tenacity. He rewards people. And there's a bunch of stories about that too. For example, Jesus is met with a Canaanite woman. And He tries to ignore her, but she persists. She persists and He says basically to her, You're a Canaanite. I'm sent to the people of Israel. And she continues to persist and finally he gives her what she wants. There's two parables that Jesus tells in Luke where he encourages his disciples to pray and not give up, but to persist, to be even obnoxious. So there's a friend at night, for example. And the friend goes next door to his neighbor at night and he demands that he help with some bread. Or there's a widow and an unjust judge. It seems a little odd that Jesus would compare God to an unjust judge, but he does. And he says, this is how an unjust judge responds to this widow who won't leave him alone. He finally grants her the request. So wouldn't God, who actually loves you, grant your requests? When we pursue God with boldness and persistence and tenacity, God rewards that. In the rest of the Bible, Jacob or Israel, both of names are still used in the rest of the Bible, they would be synonymous with God's people. So I have a couple examples on the screen here. Psalm 147, 19 and 20. He declares His word to Jacob, His statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know His rules. Praise the Lord. Now, this is long after Jacob has been gone. This is talking about all of Jacob's descendants, all of God's people. Or in Isaiah 48, 12, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel whom I call. I am He. I am the first... And I am the last. 
there's many more. Jacob, when I did a search for Jacob, Jacob and Israel are like 200 times in the Bible. And not just in Genesis when Jacob is alive, but throughout the whole Bible. Jacob and Israel are synonymous with God's people. When you read the, particularly the poetic and the prophetic stuff, and it says Jacob and it says Israel, it's talking about all of us, all believers, really, who are God's people, including us today. So what sort of a person are you? This wrestler asked Jacob, what is your name? Which basically means, who are you? So maybe that's a question for us today. Who are you? What sort of a person are you? Jacob clung to God even after his hip was just touched out of joint. He still hung on. God's people are those who cling to him when hurting. Even when they're hurting. It's very painful to have your hip get out of joint. I've never had that, but from everything I've read, it sounds very painful. And yet Jacob hung on. It's like, no, I'm not letting this guy go. This guy can bless me and I'm going to make sure that I get a blessing. And Jacob's not the only one either. Job is a good example. He continued to call on God and to hang on to God with integrity, even though everybody else in his life was telling him to give up. And there's Habakkuk too, who kind of goes back and forth with God about justice. God's people cling to him even when they're hurting. Even when they're hurting. And even when that hurt comes from God himself. I mean, Jacob being in pain from a dislocated hip there, that was at God's hand. It was God that did that. Or, or in the case of Job, it was God that allowed all of that calamity to happen. And Job still hung on. So when you and I are hurting, even if it's hurt that comes from God Himself, hang on to Him. He's the one who has the blessings that you need and that you want. And it talks sometimes in the Bible about how God gives us some pain and suffering once in a while. It says in Revelation 3.19, Jesus says to one of the churches, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. In Psalm 141, it says, Let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil for my head. My head will not refuse it. Sometimes God gives us some difficulties, some pain, some suffering. And it's not because He doesn't like us. It's to make us stronger. Hang on to Him. Keep hanging on to Him. And God's people... They cling to him when they're hurting, but they also wrestle with him. God's people wrestle with him. It was uh, Jacob's grandfather named Abraham. And uh, he pled for Sodom. And it was, he was like negotiating with God. You know, what if, what, if there's, what if there's 50 people there that are righteous? Would you spare the city for that? Yeah. And then he... Brings them down to ten. If there's ten people righteous, would you spare this city? Yep, I would. It's kind of a negotiation there, kind of a kind of a wrestling. In Colossians four verse twelve, there's a interesting verse here. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. So he. He's struggling in his prayers for you, it says. So, how do you wrestle? God's people, they strive with him. They wrestle with him, if you will. How do we do that? When big stuff is at stake, pray like you're wrestling. Pray like you're wrestling. Like you're, like you're fighting, like you're engaged, like you're not going to let God go until He answers you. 
Pray not just for five minutes. Pray for hours. Pray all through the night. Jacob says wrestled with this guy all night long. Pray all night. Call in sick to work the next day. Pray all day. Don't stop for food. This is called fasting. It's not something we do very often. But continue to pray. Pray like you're fighting. If you search the scriptures for God's promises and bring those up in prayer. Lord, you promised that you would never leave me or forsake me. Lord, throw those promises out there. Hold God to those promises. If you read the Psalms and the prophets, they do this all the time. God, you promised this. Lord, remember this promise. I'm holding you to this promise. Don't be polite. When you're wrestling with somebody, you're not polite. Jacob wasn't polite. He says, let me go. No, I'm not letting you go. You have to bless me first. Don't let go. Now, I want to throw something out there that many of you know quite well. God is big. He's all-powerful. We cannot force his hand. We can't make him do what we want him to do. It doesn't matter how long we wrestle or how long we fast or anything like that. We cannot force God to do anything. That's not how God works. God is not magic. He acts on love and grace. He's a relational God. So we can plead with him. We can be bold. We can wrestle with him. We can hold his promises up to him and expect him or call him to fulfill those promises. We can do that. We can't force him, but we can be aggressive. We can be aggressive. And this is what Jacob is doing. Now, if you do that, you might walk away limping. You might. Jacob did. But you will also walk away blessed. If you go after God aggressively, you will walk away with answers. You won't be blessed by cheating the name Jacob. This is what Jacob learned. Cheating is not the way to go. You will be blessed by striving with God, which is his new name, Israel. When we strive with God, we will always get more than we bargained for. God answers us even more than what we ask for, even beyond what we can ask and imagine, both in challenge and in reward. So, I'm going to just, there's a couple of verses, Malachi 3 verse 10. It says, bring the full tithes into the storehouses that there may be food in my house. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. And then Matthew 7. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock. And the door will be open to you. Anyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to whoever knocks, the door will be open. Be aggressive with God in prayer. Particularly when something big or important is at stake. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, you... You reward tenacity and uh, aggressiveness. Then, Lord, you are a great, powerful God. And and, uh, it might be a little intimidating to to be aggressive with you, but, Lord, um, you've, you've given us these examples. So, Lord, help us to be aggressive and, Lord, to pursue you. Because, Lord, you are the one who holds the blessings that we need and what we are wanting. So Lord, help us to do that. Teach us to do that, like your servant Jacob, so that we would not cheat, but Lord, that we would strive with you. In Jesus' name, amen.